So thank you very much for joining today. And today we move on to the second section of the 12th chapter. Broadly, the 12th chapter has the first section which talks about various levels of devotion, starting from impersonal to personal and within personal various levels. And then the second half, 12, 13 to 20, talks about the relationship between virtue and devotion. So the verse we are discussing today is 12, 13. So we're going to talk about religion and uh, individual behavior. Does religion make people better or worse? Or why are some religious people so ill-behaved? So this is describing the virtues that if they are present in a devotee, they attract Krishna. Advesta sarva bhutana maitra karuna evacha nirmamo nirahankara samadukha sukakshami. This is two verses together. Santushta satatam yogi etatma dhudanishchaya mayar pitmano buddhi yomad bhakta same priyaha. So Krishna says, Yomad Bhaktaha Same Priyaha. Such a devotee is dear to me. So who is, <coughs> who is that devotee here? A devotee is Advesta, one who is not envious to anyone. Sarvabhuta, Maitraha, one who is friendly. Karuna Evacha is compassionate to everyone. Nirmamo Nirahankaraha is non possessive, non arrogant, and is steady is not uh, susceptible to mood swings. Samadukha sukha kshami and one who is tolerant, one who is forgiving. Such a devotee is dear to me. So here, if you look at these virtues, these are virtues that even uh, a person who is not necessarily a devotee will appreciate. You know, we all, nobody likes to be with somebody who is arrogant unless that person is going to do something for them then they might just curry favor with that person for the time being. You like a person who is uh, non-possessive. They like to share whatever they have. And we all like people who are non-envious, uh, non who are friendly, who are kind, who stay calm amidst challenges, who are not constantly critical and fault-finding, but who tolerate uh, others' mistakes. So we see Krishna is talking here of devotees in terms of universal virtues. And then he says, Yomad Bhaktaha Same Priya, that such a devotee is dear to me. So at one level, we could say that all devotees are dear to Krishna. Those who love Krishna, Krishna loves them. Krishna, in fact, loves all living beings. He is Suhrudam Sarva Bhutanam. That is 529 in the Gita. He's the well-wisher of all living beings. So even those who are not devoted to him, and what to speak of those who are devoted to him. But among those who are devoted to him, those who develop godly virtues, they are the most dear to him. So Krishna's characteristic is Suhrudam Sarva Bhutanam. He's the well-wisher of all living beings. And Krishna is telling his devotees' characteristic is Advesta Sarva Bhutanam Maitraha Karuna Evacha. So it's essentially the same. This says Krishna is the well-wisher of everyone. The dev those devoted to him are also the well-wishers of everyone. Now, of course, devotees are finite beings. So naturally, they cannot do as much as God can from everyone. But the idea is in disposition, not necessarily in the contribution that we do. But in disposition, uh, those who are devoted to God, if they are godly, Krishna, they become dear to Krishna. So the, the relevant point for our talk today is that uh, devotion, when it is coupled with virtue, with virtuous conduct, with good behavior, that is what is pleasing to Krishna. So we will talk today broadly about the negative perceptions of religion in today's world and how well grounded they are in terms of reality. So I'll talk about how there's been radicalization of religion and there is a radicalization of atheism also. And then I will talk about the three modes and religion within three modes. And then finally, we'll talk about harmonizing devotion and virtue. So now radicalization refers to basically things becoming more extremist, intolerant, violent. So if you look at religion, 
it has been one of the most influential cultural forces for a long time in known human history even if we talk about history in terms of as it is uh, known by modern empiric modern empirical or modern terms so but in that history also there were the crusades which were fought between the uh, christians and the muslims and then there was a what is there was a 100 year war that was fought between the protestants and christians which protestants and catholics which tore europe apart and that was one of the reasons why uh, many people left at least some people left europe to come to america and that was uh, the mayflower ship and everything that's how america was started by quite pious people who were being persecuted in america in europe then we of course have terrorism while uh, while terror is refers to a generic feeling of fear of great fear terrorism as a ism where there is sudden uh, unplanned attack on civilians uh, is a relatively new phenomena there was always say when a king would conquer another king maybe the soldiers would sack their cities but that was more plunder terrorism in the sense of targeting of civilians in sudden and unpredictable in sudden and uh, deliberate ways that is relatively a modern phenomena now terrorism is often justified or uh, done in the name of religion and then of course suicide bombers probably nothing uh, nothing uh, has affected the modern perception of religion negative perception of religion more than 911 where uh, the planes hitting into the twin towers uh, that is something which is indelibly uh, etched into the modern psyche and then of course there is jihad now jihad is a term associated with a particular religion but overall the idea is there is a perception that religion that, that relig, relig, religion leads to intolerance religion leads to non not to uh, to narrow mindedness and it eventually fosters violence now in the material world whenever things go towards extreme in one direction they also go towards extreme in another direction as a counter reaction just like a pendulum the pendulum goes too much on one side then eventually it will rush over to the other side so there has been a radicalization of atheism in recent times also and now how has that happened i'll just share here a few quotes by some prominent atheists now, these are people are actually not atheists they are what you would call as antitheists they are aggressively against religion against god so is a prominent atheist who made a series of documentaries called religion is the source of all evil now all evil not just evil but all evil then the atheists who say that teaching religion to children is child abuse why because they feel that children don't have the rational faculty to uh, to discern and if they are indoctrinated into particular ideologies then they grow up to become machines of death death machines of hate and death so um, that is true in certain extreme situations but most religions teach teach people to mostly religious teachings involve uh, encouraging fostering virtues and good behavior in children but child abuse is a very provocative term to use then there is a prominent atheist who said that if i had to choose between removing religion and rape from the world i would remove religion because his his idea is rape causes occasional damage to people but religion causes constant damage now to even come up with a comparison like that we can imagine how much uh, how much antipathy a person must have uh, to think like this and then of course the other atheist who says religion teaches a dangerous nonsense that life doesn't end with that now why a dangerous nonsense because his idea is that people wouldn't become suicide bombers if they believed that life would end with that and therefore the dangerous nonsense however if you see the first suicide bombers were the were in sri lanka there was the libre ltt was a radical organization and they started suicide bombing and ltt was at least at that time the way it was it was non theistic it was more more of a regional political movement but the idea is now life that life continues beyond death this is a is a broad spread spiritual teaching and it has given so many people hope and purpose for living it gives people a sense of justice uh, 
in terms of beyond this life and there are a broad variety of effects of this teaching on this principle but it's nonsense and this dangerous nonsense so these are so as i said there has been aggressive antitheism also and so there has been some extremist uh, radicalization of religion and there has been the radicalization of atheism and the radicalization of atheism has largely been a result of the radicalization of religion or at least the perceived radicalization of religion so now what is the reason for this extreme antipathy towards religion what is the reason let's look at it one of the most common conceptions is that religion makes people violent religion causes war is it really true if you look at it even recent human history most wars including world war and world war 2 they are not fought on religious grounds per se they are fought on either we could say ideological grounds nazi ideology was there or before that the first world war it was territorial it was territorial gain power wealth so if we if we consider the korean conflict the vietnam war whatever wars we have had which have largely influenced human society in the recent few centuries they have not been fought on religious grounds if we consider india was invaded by many invaders there are many islamic invaders who came but the islamic invaders often fought among themselves the turks the mughals and so many other dynasties were there and they fought among themselves at times if we consider even religious extremism if we consider the middle east right now more than the conflict between say islam and judaism it's within islam it's when shias and sunnis so and often the biggest casualties of islamic extremism is is muslims itself there so many muslims which are who are who are who have become refugees because of the violence in their countries so now is religion causing war we'll come to that when ashia the sunnis are fighting is it is it their religious ideology or is it something else but let's look at a few other statistics the biggest violence in human history was caused by communist ideology you know this is such an important fact of human history but it the ignorance about it is is spectacular that in ussr and china 100000 people were 100 million people were killed actually 100 million people were killed by the government itself by the government the government decided that anybody who did not agree with their ideology anybody who was possibly a suspect just kill them in ukraine there was a man made plague which killed oh, sorry man made famine which killed 10 million people basically the government decided that we will centralize all food stock we'll get all the food to one place and then we'll distribute it all and i don't, I don't want to go into the specifics of it all but there but just there was immense starvation and the government had food but the government didn't supply it now 100 million people is more than first world war first world second world war combined together in fact and all other wars that we know they would amount to about 35 million so i given the reference also their lethal politics soviet genocide and mass murder since 1917 so now that means we see that non religious factors have been involved in causing war now communism was not just non religious it was anti religious uh, karl marx famously or infamously said that religion is the opium of the masses and there was systematic persecution of religion in during soviet times mostly there were people were christians so christians were persecuted churches were burned priests were uh, killed and even hari krishna devotees who were in the ussr they also su- suffered quite uh, heinously so if we consider violence the track record or the historical track record is something significantly different and then let's look at it from another perspective the number of people killed in wars and violent conflicts in the 20th century is seven times more than those killed in previous 19 centuries combined together mm-hmm. and yet historical data shows that the 19th the 20th century was the least religious century in human history because of various factors uh, the perception that religion is religion religion is irrational the perception the the urbanization 
because of which people moved from their native places to other places, immigration, because of the breakdown of the family structure, because of various things, religious traditions were not passed down to people so much. So the least religious century in human history was the most violent. So how can we really blame religion for, for violence when, when the data speaks the correlation between violence and religious affiliation is actually inversely proportional. Now, now why was there so much conflict in the, uh, in the last century? Why so much violence? Because you know, the technology made killing much easier. We developed weapons of mass destruction. And uh, now do we blame technology for the deaths? Obviously not. We will say that no, technology is a tool used by people. But then so is ideology, whether it is secular or it is religious. So there is basically a blame game where religion often gets a bad name. Now, there is no denying here that evil has been done and in a lot of quantity in, by, in the name of religion. No doubt about it. But the, we are here we are talking about more in terms of scale and perception. The, the actual violence Negative, the actual negativity that has been done because of religion is far less than what it is perceived to be. Mm -hmm. So now there is you quite often a misrepresentation of religion in the media because what happens is the good inspired by religion is regular and that's why it becomes invisible. Mm -hmm. uh, so religion encourages people to be charitable, it encourages people to take responsibility in their lives. And uh, say responsibility means responsibility to one's family members, responsibility to one's society. It encourages people to be moral. But the, the idea that um, there is a God who watches over us and to whom we are accountable is one of the biggest, has been one of the biggest civilizing forces in human history. So um, I think it was Voltaire and Bertrand Russell when he would have discussions about atheism uh, with his intellectually lead friends, he would always have them in, a, in his library with all the doors and windows closed. Why? Because he did not want his servants to hear that God doesn't exist. Because he, he thought that if they believe that God doesn't exist, they will steal silver and gold from my house. So God does, I, I know God doesn't exist, but let them believe God exists. So, but the point is that uh, the fear of God makes people moral to some extent. Now, that is not the healthiest reason to be moral, but that is a fact. So many people are inspired to live virtuously, but because this is regular, it becomes invisible. You now people regularly give some charity for some good causes. People regularly do some duty, but okay. So if something just happens regularly, then what happens? It's not newsworthy. Something has to be unusual, sensational, uh, then it becomes newsworthy. So bad incited by religion is intermittent and it is ultra visible. So if there are terrorist attacks, then what happens? It, it just catches the media attention incessantly. Now, I'm not saying here there is a malicious agenda. It is just, that's how news works. Whatever is considered newsworthy is what is unusual, not what is regular. So, Overall, there is a negative perception and we have this as a result of various factors. So at first section, I talked about how there has been radicalization of religion and of atheism both. Now, let's move on to religion in the three modes. The modes are a concept that runs throughout the Gita and in the 14th chapter, we'll discuss about it more. But here, We'll talk about it primarily in terms of changing people. So we discussed in the previous slide that, that actually it is just as technology can't be blamed for people being violent. So even religion, can, ideology can't be blamed. Religion can't be blamed. It is people who do violence and people can use various pretexts for doing violence. It can be race. It can be nationality. It can be gender. It can be color. It can be religion. So what can change people? That is the question now. So now, before we understand this, what can make people behave in better ways? We have to understand 
why people behave the way they do and the bhagavad gita uses an analytical frame called the modes now the modes are a subtle concept but at this stage we'll focus on one understanding of the modes that the modes are subtle forces that shape the interaction between consciousness and matter so consciousness comes from the soul all around us there's the world which is made of matter so how consciousness perceives matter and what consciousness pursues within matter what it sees and what it seeks that is determined by the modes and the modes are broadly classified into three categories so to understand that before we go to the modes we'll talk about one more concept and we'll interrelate the two so there are virtues and vices now what do we mean by virtues and vices virtues are qualities and when those qualities are present within us they inspire us to act in ways that benefit us and benefit others so for example uh, compassion generosity uh, kindness humility sensitivity moderation these are all we can call as virtues so uh, these are in one sense universally appreciated because they just make a person a better human being so a culture of say wanting to share instead of just grab that's a virtue now in contrast to these there are vices vices they impel us to act in ways that hurt us and hurt others so there could be greed there could be possessiveness there could be anger there could be um, envy so basically there are virtues and vices now if you look at the three modes now within every heart there is there is virtues and there are vices but when a person is in the mode of goodness virtue is in control broadly speaking there are vices but they are regulated they are disciplined when somebody is in passion the virtue and vice are relatively more balanced but vice tends to be stronger than virtue not hugely stronger but slightly stronger it can take a person down relatively easily and in ignorance vice dominates virtue hmm? vice becomes more or less in control so we could say that within the human heart and this is in every human heart the the line between good and evil the line between virtue and vice it doesn't really it's not that some people are were that okay people of this country or this religion or this uh, ideology they are vicious and these people are virtuous no the line dividing virtue and vice line dividing good and evil it runs through every human heart now how much of each human heart is controlled by virtue and how much of it is controlled by vice that will vary from person to person and the modes are we could say either indicators or impellers they are both uh, of how a person is likely to behave so now we could say based on this that relatively speaking if a person is in goodness they would be able to contribute much more to society now goodness passion ignorance are universal uh, human dispositions they are they are uni- they are present in all of humanity and now let's look at this from the perspective of how it affects the interaction between people so broadly i talked about the vice virtue balance now when somebody is in goodness when they interact with each other if there are any differences they try to discuss okay what is your perspective let me understand my, let me explain my perspective and let's discuss and try to resolve the issues in passion there is domination that you know i will prove i am right and i will dominate you whereas in ignorance not only that i want to prove that i am better than you i don't even want to let you exist it leads to destruction now we all can probably think of people in our social circles also there are some people you know if there are differences of opinion okay they will try to, to resolve it amicably some people they just out to prove that they are right and some people they are not only they are out to prove that they are right they are also out to prove that the other person is wrong and not only the other person is wrong but the other person is e- foolish or evil for believing what they believe so that kind of intolerance uh, where one doesn't even want somebody different from one to exist that is typical of ignorance 
Now, again, if we see this destructive mentality, it is not just because of religion. Yes, religion, uh, there are some religious extremists who don't want uh, contrary opinions to exist. But we see in the media that is dominated by the West nowadays, by the left nowadays rather, there is an, there's an increasing phenomenon of cancel culture, where anybody who is having an opinion that is considered unacceptable, that person is so strongly condemned that that person is practically cancelled from society. So that's ignorance. So it is, so these three can be, these goodness, passion, ignorance, these can be present in atheistic people, these three can be present in religious people. These are present in all people have their behavior and their consciousness in the three modes. So now, just as technology can be misused, similarly religion can be misused. See, the purpose of religion, broadly speaking, is to increase virtues in people. If we consider any religion, if we consider, say, the Ten Commandments in Christianity, we'll say broadly, they're talking about cultivating virtues. If we talk about the regulative principles in Krishna consciousness, if we talk about the general principles or that are recommended in religion, they are meant to, they, they recommend that people live virtuously. Not only they recommend, they often insist that certain virtues are required. So overall, religion is meant to foster virtue in people. Hmm? So religion can act as a, as a process for transforming people. However, when mis religion is misused by people, then what happens is they use religion to justify, we use religion to justify what we do rather than to rectify what we do. So if I'm intolerant, then rather than rising from the mode of ignorance to the mode of goodness and becoming broad-minded, uh, trying to expand my consciousness and my understanding, I justify, I am right and you are wrong. Now, when this is done, this is misuse of religion. So if we consider, broadly speaking, the virtues that are considered ideal within various religions, they are virtues which are, which are, which are going to, which will help any society to function better. So now let's look at religion within the three modes. Mm. When religion is practiced in ignorance, here by ignorance, we're not referring to the state of ignorance. That is also an aspect of it, but we're talking about religion practiced in the mode of ignorance. The mode where people want to destroy those who oppose them, the mode where people basically were, are controlled by vice. So that is one of the characteristics of the mode of ignorance is one claims one thing to be everything. So people will take one aspect of their religious tradition and say, this is all that is. And if you agree with this, you are good. If you disagree with this, you are going to go to hell. Not only are you going to go to hell, some people will say, we will help you get there faster. So this is fragmental vision. This is 18... Uh, this is 1822 in the Bhagavad Gita. Then, if we move on, the idea here is that at this level, it is those who disagree with us must be divisive. Those who must be evil. And it becomes divisive and destructive. So, there are, it basically leads to mentality. You know, we are all good people, all other, they are bad people. And because they are bad, they must be destroyed. So, this is religion in ignorance. The Bhagavad Gita itself, if you see it, offers a very inclusive vision. Every soul is a part of God. Those who are spiritually evolved, they see all living beings equally. So now when we say religion practice in ignorance, what does it mean? It is not that religion has made people ignorant. Rather, there are people who are in the mode of ignorance. Naturally, people are across the spectrum in all the three modes. So people who are in ignorance, they sometimes start practicing religion and naturally they'll be in the mode of ignorance. And there are some leaders who exploit the ignorance of people and then who foster for, who use the mode of ignorance to further their own agendas. So then they will teach religion and also in a very fragmented and biased way. And that's how 
religion becomes practiced in the mode of ignorance. So two factors. One is there are people in ignorance who start practicing it. And there are self-interested leaders who propagate that kind of practice of religion because it serves their agendas. Then we can consider religion practiced in the mode of passion. So here the idea is so here externals are equated with essentials. So for example, if somebody has a large following, that so many people are coming, that means we must be, we must be potent. God's blessings must be with us. So that is itself considered religious success. Now that now there is populism that results because of this where people start pandering to whatever is the popular sentiment. And then here again, people seek fame, power, wealth. And if they get it, they think that's the proof that we are right. So there is a version of Christianity, which is called as prosperity gospel or prosperity theology, which holds that wealth, power, fame, these are indicators that God has blessed us. And if these are absent, that means God has cursed us. Well, that's a very oversimplified understanding. You know, one can get wealth, fame, power because of one's past karma. It may not have anything to do with God giving blessings. Because sometimes those, all those things can actually make one more selfish, can even make people demoniac. Not always, but sometimes it's possible. So the idea is that there is no necessarily one-to-one -one correlation between prosperity and and spirituality or devotion or religious success. So, but there is a presumption like that. And that is largely religion in the mode of passion. Now, prosperity gospel, although it's quite popular, uh, typically in America, but it has also been critiqued even by other Christians. And prosperity mm, theology would be something similar to Karmakand in the Vedic tradition. So we do religion and then we get prosperity by that. So at one level it is true, but that vision of religion itself is not very enlightened. So dharma leads to artha. That is the idea. Well, okay. And then we can fulfill karma. We, we practice religion. Then that will give us prosperity. And then we can, we can fulfill our desires. That's, that's okay at one level. But there is much more. There is moksha. There is liberation that is to be sought. That is the ultimate goal of life. And of course, within moksha, there is bhakti and prema. There is love of God that is to be sought. So all that is overlooked. When the religion in the mode of passion, it equates externals with essentials. And then in some cases, when religion is practiced in the mode of passion, it is not a spiritual search for God as it becomes a political search for power. Where people are, if people come together in a group not so much because they want to worship God, but because they want to have that group power. And again, as I said, when is religion practiced in passion? There are already people who are in the mode of passion and there are religious leaders who will utilize that passionate mentality of people to serve their own agendas. Then religion practiced in goodness. What is it characterized by? It sees the uh, it is is the essential equality of everyone. It states that actually we have sarvabhuteshu yenaikam bhavam ekam avibhaktam sarvabhuteshu tadgyanam vidhisatvikam. So all living beings, there is an imperishable spirit. There is one imperishable spirit that animates all living beings. So we are all essentially spiritual and similar. That understanding is understanding in the mode of goodness. Now that exactly may not be the understanding, but that all living beings are children of God. All living beings are parts of God. There is a spark of the divine in every living being. That is the idea which is there in religion practice in goodness. And what happens is that mode of this is if we want, if there are differences, as I said, discussion for mutual understanding, then the deliberation, there is introspection for deeper self understanding. You know, what is it that I'm doing? Why am I doing this? So, such deliberation or introspection that is from that is quite conspicuously absent in religion in the mode of passion or ignorance. 
So deliberation can often lead to self-criticism. You know, this is I'm not doing this right. This is what I should do. But there is, a, but in religions and passion and ignorance, there is more criticism of others than any honest self-reflection. And then, most importantly, in religions practice in the mode of goodness, there is purification for elevating one's consciousness. That means for rising from passion, ignorance to passion to goodness uh, towards transcendence, or we could say. For elevating consciousness means for decreasing vice and increasing virtue within one's consciousness. So now the purpose, the religion is meant to be a, at one level, a force for change. It is meant to be a, not force in the sense of forcing people, but force means in the sense of power or agency. It is meant to be an agency which changes people for the better. And uh, it is meant to change people for the better, but that will happen when it is practice in the mode of goodness, or at least its practice is led by people in the mode of goodness, who will even people in the mode, of, maybe in the mode of passion, or ignorance, they'll be guided to rise upward. But if people practicing are in the modes of passion, and ignorance, and leading them, those leading them are also exploiting that rather than helping them trans elevate, helping them elevate, then it will become a problem. Now, there's a when people are practicing religion, at one level, belonging to some group which which has a big tradition which has some uh, which has some extraordinary characters as its ideals that makes people feel good about themselves so what happens is that when people start practicing religion they start presuming that i have i have already become a good person just because i am practicing this so when you say practicing religion it might be say going to a church or chanting some mantras or doing some rituals. That's the idea of practicing religion. The people think that, okay, this is, I've already become a good person. But just because we have a good car and a good map doesn't mean we are good drivers. You know, we may know where to go. We may know, uh, we may have a tool to go there, but going there requires learning some skills. So to put it another way, a car, the car, is like religion that's religion is this practice it is the set of practices that are meant to take our consciousness from ignorance toward transcendence the map is ideology or philosophy the word ideology has a negative connotation uh, philosophy relatively has a more neutral or positive connotation but whatever it is but it is, it is basically a worldview it's a way of looking at things so it's like the map but the driving ability is virtues Suppose somebody has a car, but they don't know how to drive. Then their driving that car may well cause more, they, it may trouble them, it may trouble others. It may trouble them because they themselves, sorry, it may trouble them because they themselves are, uh, they may themselves are running into danger, they might meet with an accident, or it might trouble them, or they, they might trouble others because they might hit someone else. And that could also be a problem. So religion in his practice in the three modes, and there's not sufficient understanding of where one is at, then one presumes that because I'm doing this activity, I know, I know this and I do this, therefore I'm already a good person. No, driving ability has to be consciously learned. So it is not that religion automatically makes one virtuous. Or it is not that having a particular, every religion broadly has two things, some things to do and some things to believe. So it's not just that doing certain things and believing certain things automatically makes me a good person. It is meant to make me a good person. Hmm? But it doesn't mean that I'm already a good person. And this brings us to the last part. We'll talk about harmonizing religion and virtue and specifically devotion and virtue because Krishna is talking here about devotion in the Bhagavad Gita. So if we consider a, the, a, a graph of virtue and religion, we could, as, we could press in four quadrants. Now if somebody has neither virtue nor do they have any religion, then such people will basically be antisocial elements. They, they, they can be, they can be say, violent, they can be, they can be robbers, they can be all kinds of criminal activities who don't believe in anything higher and they just don't have any higher qualities also. Now, if somebody has religion, but they don't have virtues, then they will be religious people, but they will be 
in a sense bad people bad people means they they could be bad right from the they're, they're terrorists and they're out to destroy others or they could be bad in the sense that they are just uh, using religion for their personal gain and they're very cynically doing that so uh, they think that their religion itself gives them a license it 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 justifies whatever vices they have whatever they do so you know everything is good when it is done in the name of god well not not so simple not so simple you know that we have to do good and uh, so this is these are the these are this this category of people are the people who quite often give religion a bad press and they also end up alienating not only non religious or atheistic people they also end up alienating religious people from religion mm-hmm. now if you consider there are if somebody doesn't have religion but they have virtues then they are good atheists now can atheists be good people of course you know virtue and religion doesn't have anything uh, they they are two different things so there can be atheists who can be kind who can be well mannered who can be gentle who can be even charitable however this is a subject which i'll discuss in the 16th chapter where we'll talk about atheism more in detail but if atheists are good people it is not because of their atheism it is independent of their atheism there is nothing within atheism that will make people want to be good so maybe it is because of their past upbringing people are good and somehow because of having bad experiences with religion or because of exposure to atheist they chose to become atheist so atheist can be good people but that doesn't necessarily mean that atheism makes people good and then what krishna is talking about here is the, those who have virtue and those who have a religion krishna says they are dear to me so those are exemplary so now now we can talk about bhakti and religion often we talk about not religion but spirituality also now spiritual what is spirituality religion is often associated with certain rituals and dogmas spirituality is associated with meaning purpose spirituality is associated with more of attitudes open mindedness experience that's all fine so spirituality is more associated with something it has a more positive connotation religion has a more negative connotation uh, but whatever here we are focusing on the use of the word religion but bhakti what is it bhakti is the most potent and transformational form of religion so we could say bhakti has all the attributes of spirituality but bhakti also has the aspects of religion because there are certain things to be practiced certain things to be done but these are not so much rituals as transformational practices so if we practice bhakti diligently the result of that will be our virtues within us will become activated and energized and the vices within us will become subordinated and eliminated and many people have these experiences somebody might have some some particular vice say they might be succumb they might be into alcoholics and they start practicing bhakti they start chanting the holy names the alcoholism goes away somebody might have severe anger issues and they start practicing bhakti and their anger goes down so we can see that bhakti can and does transform people so bhakti is meant to foster virtue so if you consider three modes ignorance passion goodness bhakti is meant to take people from the lowest mode to the highest level of reality not only to goodness but beyond goodness to transcendence and that is the primary purpose uh, for practicing bhakti it is meant to transform us now this brings us to a question if the we see here krishna's emphasis in seven verses from 1213 to 1220 krishna is emphasizing various virtues and he's saying those with these virtues are dear to me so are devotees dear to him is yes, devotees in general are dear to him but devotees with virtues are especially dear to him that means he just he doesn't want us to simply be okay say maybe come to a temple chant some mantras read some sacred books do some worship that is good but all that needs to transform us all that needs to make us better human beings 
when Shri Prabhupada was asked, how do we know your followers? He said that they are perfect gentlemen and ladies. Now he didn't say that they chant so many rounds of Mahamantra, that they wake up in the morning, they, this four, they follow these four regs, they do this, this, this. Well, that is there. But the world doesn't care for what you, what you do in your personal religious space. The world cares for how you behave. So, Prabhupada said, devotees are perfect gentlemen and ladies. The idea is that the devotees exhibit virtues. And virtues, uh, now virtues may not be practiced by everyone, but most people will like a person who is kind, not a person who is harsh. Most people will like a person who is... Um, who, is, who likes to share rather than a person who likes to grab. So virtues, even if people don't have them, mostly people appreciate them. So Krishna is saying in that sense that those devotees with virtues, they are dear to him. So, and the virtues which he talks about are non-sectarian virtues. Now, that means whether a person believes in a particular religion or doesn't believe in a particular religion. You know, if we look at things, when we like someone, it is... It is, there are certain qualities in people which, which, which make us bond with them. So, whether that person belongs to a particular, has a particular kind of belief system or a particular kind of uh, ideology, that doesn't uh, necessarily determine all their qualities. So, we might find that somebody uh, may be from a different tradition, but if they have certain virtues, then we connect with them. Somebody might be from our own, say, religious group or spiritual affiliation or whatever. But then sometimes you may not bond with them. Because virtues, they are non-sectarian. And that doesn't mean that virtues uh, uh, are unaffected by one's beliefs or one practices, one's practices. Uh, what we believe and what we practice is meant to foster virtue. But that doesn't mean just because we believe something or we practice something, automatically we are virtuous. And that brings us to the last part of the talk today. So what if devotees lack virtue? I mean, at least we should work to develop virtue. We can't claim to have virtue when we don't have it. We can't claim that oh, because I'm a devotee, I'm already virtuous. No, we need to be, we need to be self-critical and we develop, we strive to develop virtue. And then this leads to a question that does devotion automatically lead to virtue? Or does virtue need to be cultivated consciously? That means this, if somebody just starts chanting Hare Krishna, will they automatically become kind, sensitive, forgiving? Will they automatically develop virtues? Or will they need to be cultivated consciously? Well, the answer is both. Why both? Because at one level, devotion does lead to virtue. Devotion brings about purification. And the soul is a part of God. The soul is godly. So therefore, devotion leads to the manifestation of the soul's virtues. So in that sense, devotion leads to the development of virtue. So just by, just by chanting Hare Krishna, just by practicing bhakti, a person will develop virtue. At the same time, now if we are to cultivate, execute devotion responsibly, we need virtue. Say so if we are living in a community, and if we are insensitive, if the level, of, the language we use is is too too is somewhat abusive, if we are if we are not if we are, if we are irresponsible, not doing what we are to, what we tell we say we will do, then that is going to create problems. So to execute devotion responsibly in this world, we need virtue, and therefore devotees need to cultivate virtue consciously also. Now, why cultivate virtue consciously? Won't it come automatically? Well, it depends. Yes, ultimately, when there is pure devotion manifested in the heart, then virtues will manifest naturally. But for all of us, we come from particular conditionings. And because of particular conditionings, we come from particular conditions in the past and particular conditionings from the past. And because of these, uh, we may have certain virtues more and certain virtues less. And the path for the manifestation of certain virtues might be straightforward for us. And for the path for the manifesting of some other virtues may be long winded and, uh, and steep. It may take a long time for us. 
so if some virtues are not manifesting naturally by the practice of bhakti and those virtues are required for us to grow spiritually for us to contribute socially also then we need to develop that virtue so we see cultivation of virtue as integral to devotion not independent to devotion that means that say for example humility and tolerance trunadapi sunijina tarorapi sahishna amanina amanadina kirtaniya sadahari so to glorify krishna we need humility and tolerance so somebody might say i will glorify krishna even if i am arrogant even if i am intolerant well you won't be really glorifying krishna if somebody is arrogant and intolerant what they will be glorifying is their own ego they will speak about krishna but they are speaking about krishna will be a tool for showing people how much i know how scholarly i am how how devoted i am it won't really either take their audience much toward krishna or even take them toward krishna so bhakti so when you talk about devotion rather than reducing devotion to a certain set of practices or a certain set of beliefs we see devotion as encompassing our entire life and how we behave in our life it's all a part of our devotion that how we interact with each other uh, that if somebody very prayerfully chants and dances and sings in kirtan and then they go out and yell at us they yell at other people well that yelling is 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 not independent of their devotion that yelling is going to affect you know, our devotion is not just seen by how we interact with god it is also seen by how we interact with all the parts of god so cultivating virtue is integral to devotion so devotion is not just a set of rituals or certain certain set of beliefs but it is a way of living and that way of living will be uplifted by the practice of bhakti in terms of certain practices and beliefs but uplifting that way of living is itself also bhakti in this way if somebody practices bhakti diligently yes it will definitely make people better and by making people better that is the most foundational way in which it can contribute to making the world better so i'll summarize what i spoke today i spoke today on the topic of does religion make people better or worse why are some religious people so ill behaved so i talked broadly about three things first is the radicalization of religion and the radicalization of atheism how whether we talk about the crusades or the hundred year wars or religious or terrorism all that has led to people perceiving that religion makes people violent and because of that the pendulum swing to the other way and there's violent opposition to religion not violent in terms of say religious people being killed but violence in terms of intellectually religion being vehemently condemned and i look at some of the some of the radical thoughts of atheists where they think that religion is the source of all evil so now what what is the we discuss we deconstructed and debunked some of the uh, some of the idea that are used to condemn religion does religion cause wars well world war 1 world war 2 were not uh, induced by religion then the communist ideology which killed 100 million people was explicitly anti religious and then if the most ir- most irreligious century in human history was the most violent so what caused that violence so it is definitely not religion because religion was least influential in this century then what so many people were killed because they have people had weapons for mass destruction but do we blame the technology that developed the weapons no because technology is a tool because the technology is a physical tool similarly ideology is an intellectual tool so then what is it that makes people act the way they do for that we introduce the the frame of the three modes so why is violence increased in the 20th century because more and more people are in the modes of passion and ignorance so we discussed in goodness the modes are ways in which uh, we consciousness interacts with matter so in, t- in terms of virtue and vice virtue enables us to act in ways that are beneficial for us and others why vice in ways that are harmful for us and others so in goodness virtue is in control in passion vice starts uh, overpowering virtue and in ignorance vice is in control 
So the modes of passion and ignorance have increased and that's why violence has increased. Whatever be the reason for it, race or nationality or color or gender or religion for that matter. And then it talked about how uh, when people interact with each other in the mode of goodness, there's discussion, in the mode of passion, there's domination, mode of ignorance, there is destruction. Then we talk about religion within the three modes. Religion and ignorance takes one thing to be everything and becomes divisive and destructive. Those who don't agree with that thing are considered evil. Religion in the mode of passion equates externals with essentials, seeks name, seeks fame, glory, power, and it becomes a it, it leads to things like prosperity theology. And then religion and goodness. It is concerned with, uh, it sees the essential equality of all living beings and it's concerned with elevation of one's consciousness. It's concerned with discussion or introspection. So now when we talk about religion in the three modes, there are two factors over there. One is people themselves are in these three modes and people from all modes might come to religion. But the key thing is, what are the kind of leaders that are leading them? So some people might use people's ignorance of people's passion to, pers to, to pursue their own selfish agendas. And then I talked about how bhakti, we talked about religion and virtue, and bhakti is uh, meant to be not just a set of uh, rituals or set of uh, uh, dogmas. Bhakti is actually meant to connect us with God and to make us godly. So bhakti is uh, the most potent and transformational form of religion. It leads to the uh, the manifestation of virtue and the uh, subordination and elimination of vice. So we talked about how Krishna specifically says that those devotees who have virtues are dear to him. And then I talked about the four quadrant graph that ideal best are the devotees with virtue. If, if there are religious people without virtue, then they'll, they will become uh, the become they will be a bad religionist who will give bad press and they will create atheism more and more. Then we talk about atheists can be good, but it's not that atheism makes them good. It is their goodness is independent of their atheism. And then we talk about antisocial elements when the, neither religion nor virtue. Then does religion automatically foster virtue? Well, no, it's like somebody has a car and a map that doesn't make them automatically good drivers. So, they have to learn to drive well. Similarly, virtue has to be developed. So does bhakti lead to automatic the development of virtue? Yes. Ultimately, yes. Because bhakti brings us and removes the coverings on the soul. And then the virtues that are innate in the soul come out. But removing that covering may take time. So for practicing bhakti in the world, we need to also, we need certain virtues. So rather than reducing bhakti to certain rituals and uh, dogmas, we see bhakti as inclusive. And we see the cultivation of virtue as integral to devotion, not independent of devotion. So thank you very much. Hare Krishna. So today I have to go for another class soon. So we, we can have about five to uh, seven minutes of questions. Are there any questions here? Yes, what is the difference between religion and ideology? Well, ideology is more of a worldview. Religion is more a way of practice. So ideology is more intellectual. Religion is more practical. Of course, these are broad divisions. And you could say multiple things are included within it. Religion also has an ideology. And every ideology will have some kind of things that are to be done when you believe in that ideology. So in that sense, they are overlapping, but broadly we could say. So we see in India, almost all schools, colleges and universities oppose any kind of religious practice. Well, that's because India is, India grew or India emerged through partition where there was religious violence and it was felt that uh, we should be secular. Well, being secular is fine, but secularism as uh, it doesn't have to lead to uh, antipathy towards religion. It ideally means neutrality towards religion. So it's unfortunately that in India, in the name of secularism, 
we have disconnected ourselves from our own tradition and our own roots so this is a problem where uh, we also need to reposition the tradition not just as a source of religion but as a source of wisdom the bhagavad gita the mahabharata the ramayana these are books which have shaped indian society and if you can present them as books of wisdom not just books of religion then they can be read accordingly okay so i'll take this one last question that uh, why do we need to cultivate virtue independently does that mean chanting is not potent enough uh, there is also the bhagavatam verse which says that all good qualities um are present in the devotee so yes you quoted that the first part of this verse is asyasti bhaktir bhagavatya kinchana so asyasti bhaktir bhagavatya akinchana akinchana is one who has unflinching devotion so one who has unflinching devotion will have will have of virtues manifesting within them but can we really say that we have unflinching devotion unflinching devotion is our goal it is not something which we have already achieved now sometimes when we quote verses it's important to know scripture and to know some verses from scripture but also is important to know the context if you look at that whole section in the bhagavatam where the verses are quoted whether it's basically a comparison of bhakti with other paths and the point over there is that when it is said that bhaktas have all good qualities that means bhaktas don't have to practice gyana or karma or yoga to develop good qualities but that doesn't mean that bhaktas don't have to develop good qualities they are two different things the, there the contrast is between bhakti and other paths and when we have unflinching so a devotee doesn't have to go to other paths to develop anything bhakti will provide everything but what does bhakti mean bhakti is not just a set of um, set of specific religious practices bhakti is about a way of living so that verse is meant to talk about how devotion in its culmination will lead to virtues but devotion itself is inclusive devotion is so is chanting uh, not enough for developing virtues well this kind of question itself uh, indicates that uh, there is a, a particular misunderstanding of what chanting means now we see that naam naam akari bahudan ye sarva shakti satrarpita niyamita smarane na kalaha that at one level chetan mahapur is saying that there are no rules for chanting but at the next level chetan mahapur saying that we should be humbler than a humbler than a blade of grass there is a more tolerant than a tree then you can chant now there is a difference kirtaniya sadahari so to start chanting now chanting can refer to just the chanting of the hari krishna mantra chanting can also refer to the glorification of god krishna kirtan is not just reduced to chanting that means glorification of god so anybody can chant the mantras that glorify god anybody can glorify god but for their heart to be immersed in the glorification of god for that they need the virtue such as humility and tolerance so now will chanting itself lead to the development of those virtues yes it will if it is done properly but again what do we mean by chanting chanting is not just one activity of uttering certain names if that were all that the activity is then why did shri prabhupada spend so much time writing books why did our acharyas write books why did our acharyas travel to holy places and build temples now bhakti has five primary limbs bhakti has 64 activities within bhakti and if you look at the bhakti tradition there has been so much broader the devotees have built temples devotees have written or have written poetry and art and drama devotees have performed dances so why do all these things 
Now let's look at it from a uh, objective perspective. Then we'll come to the emotional perspective. Jiva Goswami is one of the most prominent uh, uh, prominent followers of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. He's called, often called as a Siddhanta Acharya. He's the person who taught, who established what is the Siddhanta of the teaching of, Chait teaching of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And Jiva Goswami went uh, from Bengal to Varanasi to learn Sanskrit under uh, Advaitic and impersonalist teacher. Now, he, because he wanted to eventually write, so Sanskrit he had to learn and he went there to learn it. Now, can we say that just, uh, oh, is chanting not powerful enough to teach you Sanskrit? You may say, what kind of question is that? Sanskrit is, is a language, it's a skill, you have to learn it. Well, so is chanting not powerful enough to, to teach you Sanskrit? They're two separate things. So, so just as there are certain things which have to be developed and that require certain efforts. Now Arjuna was a great devotee, he was a great archer. It was not his, his devotion that taught him archery. It was not that his devotion taught him archery. He had to consciously practice to learn archery. So now if you put things on a spectrum, say we may say, come on, archery is a physical skill. A language is a, maybe a verbal skill. So those are those those you have to develop those we have to put some efforts to learn them. So uh, now, in one sense, if we move in a hierarchy from the gross to the subtle, so and the spiritual is the most subtle. So are we saying that bhakti is not potent enough to teach us gross things, but it is potent enough to teach us subtle things? Well, actually, gross is relatively simpler, isn't it? No. So. Chaitanya Jiva Goswami saw his learning Sanskrit as part of his service to the Lord. Uh, Arjuna saw his learning archery as, as part of his service to the Lord, as part of his uh, of what he needed to develop, to develop, to be able to help Krishna establish Dharma. And that was also his Sobhava. So now, so what, where it is, so if something is directly related to physical, we understand, you know, the spiritual won't help me to develop the physical. Okay, it's not going to teach me a language or a particular skill like archery. But now when it comes to subtle, where it comes to, there's the, there's the, there's the, there is the gross, there's the subtle, the physical, the mental and the spiritual. Now at the level of the mental, is bhakti going to change the mind? Well, it depends by what do we mean. Are people who are of a swabhav of uh, Kshatriyas going to become Brahmanas? Well, there are certain things in the mind which are not going to change. Is it that just by practicing bhakti, somebody who is a pessimist will become optimist? Or, opti not, or optimist will become pessimist? No, we bring certain frames of mind. And you can clearly see there are some devotees who always look at all the negative things. Some devotees who are more vibrant and positive and uplifting. Now it's not necessarily that just being always optimistic is good or always being pessimistic. Always being pessimistic is not necessarily bad. Sorry, always being optimistic is not good. We also have to be realistic. But the point is that there are aspects of the mind which need a certain level of disciplining. And that may happen through bhakti, that may not happen through bhakti. So we don't have to uh, even raise a polarizing question like this. this. Chanting doesn't lead you to develop archery skills. So does, will chanting necessarily make a person tolerant? Will a person make them more, may make them sensitive? Well, let's see if it's happening well and good. If it's not happening, that simply means we need to put in some more effort. So it's not that chanting is less potent. It's rather we don't have to reduce devotion to one particular activity. Devotion is a way of connecting with Krishna. And connection with Krishna can happen through many ways. And so if chanting is all that is there to be done, why do devotees fast? Well, when devotees fast, we can chant more. Well, that's true, but fasting involves some austerity. So why do we do those austerities? Why do as a devotees travel to holy places so that we can chant more? But while traveling to holy places, there is so much inconvenience. You can say, oh, when we go there, the chanting is more potent there. That means is chanting not powerful enough where you are? Does it, that means its power depends on something else. If its power can get multiplied, by going to some holy place, then can that power 
not be affected by whether a person who is chanting it has a compassionate heart or has a narrow minded heart so we need to recognize that uh, that chanting is not just uttering a mantra chanting is glorifying the lord and there is no glorification of the lord better than a, a that the person glorifying the lord is virtuous somebody does kirtans very beautifully and then when we go and talk with them they yell at us few things is this disillusion and alienate a person who glorifies the lord wonderfully and then criticizes and condemns everyone else on the other hand if somebody glorifies the lord and then we go and talk with them and they are gentle and they are kind so that is going to glorify them that is going to or that is going to attract people more so i i don't see any reason for this polarization saying that chant, is chanting not powerful enough chanting is integral to bhakti development of virtues is integral to bhakti so whether it is causal or parallel why does it make any difference if chanting leads to the development of virtues excellent if it doesn't lead to the development of virtues all that it means is that certain conditionings may be very deep within a particular person and that may require certain conscious effort for that person to do it uh, so why not do that effort why polarize things like this we see whether it is ultimately our purpose is not just to chant our purpose is to love krishna and to inspire others to love krishna chanting is a prominent expression of loving krishna but our purpose is to develop a relationship with krishna and whatever is required for developing the relationship with krishna a devotee does that so the gopis in rindavan they're chanting krishna's names but they are also learning how to cook nicely for krishna is their chanting going to lead them to cook nicely for krishna well they don't think that chanting has to teach me cooking they are ready to do whatever it takes to serve krishna what so similarly whatever it takes for us to become as competent competent servants for krishna as possible that we do that so rather than reducing and polarizing we see bhakti as inclusive bhakti is about developing a relationship with krishna loving krishna and helping others to love krishna and whatever is required for a devotee a devotee does that so thank you very much and we will discuss if there are any future questions we'll discuss later maybe in a future session thank you